<laughs> Someone you might have heard of, Steve Wozniak. <laughs> and someone you may have heard of and you're going to hear a lot more about, Palmer Lucky from Oculus. Well, yeah. You know, I always dress like this, actually, so it's great to be here. Um, so, we're going to talk about VR, AR, all kinds of stuff, and, but I want to begin with this event. I need to know which each of your favorite superheroes are to begin with. Palmer, why don't you start? Yes, I go first. Okay. <laughs> all right. You know, I often think, man, I watch a lot of the movies, Avengers and all, and I think all of them are superheroes to me, but somehow you go back to when you were a child, before your personality settled, and it was, you know, guys would see flying starships, maybe in Star Trek or, or Star Wars, or even Superman going way back to there. Wow, I would, what if that were me someday? Mm -hmm. So I, I go, I'm old school. Superman. Yeah, uh, now modern superheroes are people that create products that you never thought you'd ever see. <laughs> All right. And Palmer represents that very well. I like, I like Captain America, but my favorite choice would have to be Meteor Man. Who? Does, does anyone remember the movie Meteor Man? <laughs> <laughs> what did Peter Man do? Uh, he was struck by a meteorite that gave him uh, super strength and invincibility, and then he defended his neighborhood from local crime. Oh. It, 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 Are there any Meteor Mans out there? Yeah. It, so, I, 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 I watched that movie. The only reason I yeah. liked it is because when I was growing up, we had the VHS tape, and I watched it about 500 times uh -huh. as kids do. Uh, so I really like that movie. And there's probably not very many Meteor Man fans out there, right. but it, 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 it was never, it never went beyond VHS. Maybe laser disc, but okay. it's worth watching. I like that you got total invincibility and then you just like protect the block. <laughs> uh, I, I think he struggles with that. You know, what, what should he be doing with his powers? Yeah. Like, you know, the things that are closest to him or the things that are bigger than him? And in the end, he makes the right decisions. All right, okay. So we're going to talk a lot about VR. Explain right now where you are with Oculus. Now, there's a bunch of them coming out this fall. Uh, there's Sony's, uh, HTC's, V5, and then yours. So we are launching the Rift at the end of this month in about 10 business days. And uh, yeah, the best one. We've been working on that for a long time. I've been working on VR since 2009, so it's pretty surreal to finally be actually shipping this, this headset. Uh, we also are partnered with Samsung, and we've, we've also shipped Gear VR, which you've tried. And right. That was the last Black Friday, so there's a bunch of those out there, and we're going to be shipping a bunch of stuff at the end of this month. So what do you th is different right now? What does this product, do you think, mean for you guys? Different, I guess different compared to prior virtual reality? Yeah. So for the first time in history, we have virtual reality technology. It's not only affordable, but it reaches a certain bar. A certain bar where people who try it get excited about it, and they understand it, and they don't write it off. It used to be in the past, uh, the 80s and 90s, the people who were the most skeptical about virtual reality were actually often the people who had actually tried it. They had seen the technology, seen the limitations, realized it was nothing like what they had seen in Hollywood and comic books and novels. And they said, oh my god, this is, this is, this is all scam. Uh, but now it's totally, and the people who hadn't tried it were the ones who were excited. You know, they saw Lawn Mower Man and or The Matrix and they thought it was going to be incredible. Now we're in this different world where we've crossed this line where VR is finally good enough at a consumer price point where the people who try it are the ones who are excited. The people who haven't tried it are the ones saying, I don't get it, I don't understand where this all is going, I'm never going to scrap a brick on my face to play games. <laughs> then you have people who try it and say, I get it, I see what's happening, I see where it's going, and I can imagine a world where it's get it. And even people who don't want to buy it today, they can see it and imagine when it will be good enough that they will want to buy it. When it's either right. cheaper or better or lighter or cooler or whatever it is that they uh, define. We'll get, we'll get to the brick on your face part in a minute. Because um, I actually saw Bradley Cooper wearing one and he was actually incredibly unattractive wearing it, which is an interesting phenomenon. Um, but Steve, how, do you, um, how do you think about VR? Because you, it's been around forever and it's been something everybody's talked about. In old days, uh, even decades ago, yeah, you would go into special facilities at a university or at NASA and put something on, and it was kind of crude. Right. And like Palmer suggesting, what really makes it go is computers get faster and faster and faster, chips get faster and faster and faster, and abilities you never had pop up. And then it's the magic people that say, well, now we can do something that is so great, I'm going to build it and turn it into reality. Um, so I, now I myself, I have, um, well, the Oculus, the Rift is not out yet, and the Sony's not out, and the Vive's not out yet. They're, they're coming, so I have the um, Galaxy, the, I mean the Gear VR, and when I put it on, it just immerses me 
I believe I'm in a different world so much, it's scary when I take it off, take the helmet off, because I'm back in my office with my desk and my chair. What? I mean, yeah, it just doesn't feel right. It feels like I was really there. Things that drag you in. If you look at the history of personal computers, visual displays, we started, you know, with the, the output was a video display with the Apple, and the Apple II computer was colored. And then over time, the display resolution got better, displays got larger, we got multiple displays a lot of times. In the movies we got, you know, IMAX film, we're getting better and better visual graphics, and now all of a sudden, at least the, the Gear VR, is 360 degrees. Everybody look down, you sit crab walking on the bottom, and look up and see, see some, some dolphins playing. I mean, it's, um, I don't know, it just pulls you in. I saw live, some live basketball games mm -hmm. with the VR, and I just said, this is an experience I've never, ever had in my life with flat screens. So and, and of course, 3D TV failed, but I, I can see why in this one, it's not gonna fail. It's gonna be so huge, and unfortunately, everybody out there might say, I gotta get one of these VR things and try it. I'm sorry, they're sold out. So, so but someday it will be a, at a much lower price point. Presumably, in how it looks. Let's talk about the format, the form factor of it. It is, you do, a lot of people, you know, now walk down the street. So they're doing this all day, this really, pretty much. Um, and people are sort of involved with their devices. This brings it to a quantum level of involvement with your device, where you're by yourself. Like you said, you don't want to come out of your little virtual reality. Wait, how long is this form factor going to be there? Where do you imagine it going? Like, everyone's going to buy these, you strap them on your face. No matter what you do, you look ridiculous doing it from everyone else looking at it, even though you're entranced in your world. How do you imagine that? How do you look at that evolving? So there's two sides. One is that I don't think that that really, like, engagement with your device comes from necessarily it being this big, heavy thing. No matter what you do, even if virtual reality was a set of sunglasses you put on, you'd still have that level of engagement where you are disconnected somewhat from the real world. Now, that doesn't mean you're alone, necessarily. Uh, in the virtual world, you actually might be far more connected with other people uh, in better That's spaces than you ever would be in your actual real world. Uh, but I'd also say that like right now, it is very much, it, like when you're in VR, you are in VR. It's like, this is the thing where you're gonna go in and it does kind of cut you off from everything that's going on in the real world. I predict it in the long run. You're gonna see augmented reality and virtual reality use the same har hardware, kind of along this, this continuum of AR and VR, to the point where people are going to be wearing devices that allow them to seamlessly move between the digital world, the real world, and the various permutations of the two, uh, various permutations of the two seamlessly. Where you'll be so able you to switch it on and off. Well, not just even switching it on and off, but doing things like taking a room that your friend is in that's being scanned by from multiple viewpoints, and then actually merging it with the space that you are in, creating a new space that's a mix of the real and the virtual that you're now interacting with. Basically, allowing you to rearrange things in the real world to be what you want them to be and have people be where you want them to be rather than where they actually are. Um, I'm not sure if people will, like, actually turning it off, you'll probably get end up just actually taking them off. but. That, that's what I think is it's going to be in the very long run. But for the foreseeable future, virtual reality is going to be a technology where you're, I don't think you're going to be walking down the street engaged in VR and bumping into people because uh, it's, it's going to be such a dedicated activity. Yeah, you don't live in San Francisco, I, I predict people are. <laughs> I, I, well, I, well, that would be sort of like self-driving cars, walking down the sidewalk and sort of see the sidewalk. There you go. <laughs> so talk a little bit about a AR, because that's been slower, the idea of AR. Mostly, I mean, Google Glass came out. It was. The fantastic idea. It is still a fantastic idea, but somewhat of a failure as a product. Uh, and it was supposed to be this AR kind of situation where you talk to it, and it, it didn't work as well as people thought it would. Go ahead. Oh, I saw. I saw that as less. I kind of like the Google Glass as experiment with a new type of of input output technology that could be part of the future, and it had some benefits. It hard to say. Does it have something that's really worth what it costs? No, but you know, some of us like to just be early adopters and play with what the future could be. Where do you imagine AR going? It, seemed, it actually seemed a lot weak. Um, I have I have prosopagnosia. I can't recognize faces. You know, so so if I was looking at you, I would just have a little thing up here in red saying your name uh -huh. to, and your, your history, your birthday, and da, 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 and everything you've ever done in your life. That's a little creepy. That's Donald Trump creepy. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, why, why, why? To help me. <laughs> yeah. So you would want that. You want all that information. I, don't, I wouldn't say I want it. I could sort of see that someday there are some light little touches to it that would help me. In. Do you imagine they are being a big deal, having becoming a big deal? Because it's, again, it's been much slower than I, I, might, I might be in somebody's, somebody's house and just point, point, point at something, um, sit on a table and tap it in a way, buy it, or find it, you know, or record it, or I, I want to get one of these. I, I, I wouldn't look at 
the progress of AR so far based on Google Glass as necessarily yeah. so like honestly I don't think that Google Glass is an augmented reality device. It's a okay. heads up display. It cannot position itself in the world in right. anything but the most but that's the concept behind it. Uh, it had your element of lightness. Yes, and, and you know it was good it was a, um, it was a good heads up display. I've used other heads up display products. It's definitely a good good at that. But it can't place virtual objects in the real world in any kind of believable way. It does, it was it, it didn't really know where in the real world it was. It was more of a duck I mean, it's a lot like you know taking your phone and holding it out here all the time in a very convenient way that you can see through. But it is still fundamentally just a screen and a camera that is is attached to your head. I think in the future we're going to see technology that much better represents augmented reality, and that's when you're going to be able to judge how fast. It's and what will that look like from your perspective? It's hard to say. It, 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 I don't think. Yes, but I like you to say. <laughs> I, I could say it. The, the thing is that there's. A, I, I know that this is going to get replayed at some point, and I'm going to be held to it, uh, and I'm probably going to be wrong. Okay. Um, I think that augmented reality technology is currently far behind virtual reality technology. It's a lot easier to make something that puts you in a virtual world than something that seamlessly mixes the real world and the digital world in a full range of brightnesses and contrasts that you get out in the real world. Um, I think that in the future, you're going to have augmented reality devices, like I said, that do AR and VR in a very lightweight, compact form factor that do all of the rendering on board the device itself, and that people are going to use those regularly, and it's not going to be something that's seen as really creepy or really weird. It's just going to be the reality. I mean, to you, it might, it might seem creepy, you know, that you have information on other people, but especially if you have the proper privacy tools where you can opt in or they can opt out, I think that a lot of people, myself included, as, as, as a younger person who, had, who doesn't really have the same concepts around those things, I think a lot of people are not going to find it creepy at all. They're going to find it extremely useful. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about where, we'll get to privacy in the next, I'm going to ask you about the FBI thing, Apple. Um, it's totally away from it, but you're sitting here, so why not? Uh, okay, good. Um, when you're thinking about where VR is going, what, which, from your perspective, both of you, let's start with Palmer, what do you think the most difficult thing to do? Is it the content creation? Is it the, 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 the topic areas that it's going to be involved in? What's the thing that, what's the challenge that you face? What's your biggest challenge? Right now, one of our biggest, I mean, content is a huge challenge, yes. I think one of the biggest challenges is the availability of the computing hardware required. Like, right now, your VR is $99 and it works with your phone, but you do have to own a flagship Samsung phone. And especially for most of the rest of the world, rather than the United States, that's a really expensive device. And then for high-end PC VR, you need a PC that costs, you know, around $1,000 and even more. And most people don't own machines that are capable of running that. As long as we're tied to that, as long as we're tied to owning other devices that are very expensive to run VR, you're always going to have limited adoption. And it isn't until virtual reality can be available to a much broader audience of people that you're ever going to see it become something like smartphones did, where everyone has it, everyone's using it. And that also opens up content, too. People who make better content, they make more varied content, uh, they make more ambitious content when they know that there is an audience that's able to uh, allow them to make back their investment, that they're able to get this thing out to it. Right now, the audience for virtual reality is very limited compared to movie theaters or smartphones or any of the other content. Delivery. Smartphones were quick to happen when, once the iPhone existed. Once the technology got good enough, once there was a point where it was something that everyone could imagine using in their daily life, then it really shot up into adoption. Before that, was there were lots of successful smartphones and lots of successful uh, portable computing devices, but none of them had the impact of later smartphones when they, you know, that, where you end up with hundreds of millions of people using them. So Steve, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to it? Well, I think it's going to be um, initially, um, like a lot of the new introductions of things like DVDs, it's going to be um, content, the software, the software that gets developed. And I think games are going to drive it all, just like they did the early start of personal computers. Um, games today to lead us to build the fastest computers and the fastest chips possible. And then, of course, the military used to drive our technology because they had all the money. They, have, they buy, because of the economies of scale, they buy those chips and get created for games. I think games are going to start it, but virtual reality is something that applies and, and just takes people into a world like when they go, people who like to go to theaters, like any kind of entertainment, a lot more than just the gamers. Right. So I think. So you think games going to are going to drive? See, I felt like you were going to say porn right there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's my answer. Um, where do you think? What do you think the biggest drivers are going to be? Porn users don't have powerful computers. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like that, that's that's the reality. Heard it here first. Porn users, you need to upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. Okay. Um, but I, like right now, people who are going to be buying the rift are people who either already own a high gaming PC 
which is mostly gamers, and, or people who are willing to buy a client PC just for virtual reality. But you have a content library that's mostly targeted towards those gamers right now. So you are going to see games and gaming technology uh, really driving virtual reality forward, not just on the consumer side, but also on the content creation side. All of this VR content, even the stuff that Hollywood is making, it's built using game engines. It's built to be using gaming tools. And the people who are building these things, even in Hollywood, are mostly game developers. They have the technology and the tools and the talent in the games industry to build these types of real-time 3D worlds. And you're going to see people who worked in the games industry and all the tools that were built for the games industry expand out to the point where they're being used for education, where they're being used for finance, where they're being used for business telepresence. All these things that don't have anything to do with gaming are all going to use gaming. Where do you imagine the second biggest area? I'm just curious, because it's travel, is it going somewhere, is it adventure or experiential things? Or I think that... And so it's not necessarily second, I think that it's not just the second biggest, it, these are going to change over time. I think that VR gaming is going to continue to grow, and it's going to grow for the foreseeable future. At the same time, all these other areas are going to grow faster than gaming, and eventually they're going to overtake it, probably in the next few years. But one thing that I'm really excited about is telepresence, the idea that you can have people that are around the world put into the same virtual space and feel like they're actually in the same real space together. That means that I don't have to burn thousands of gallons of jet fuel flying around the world. I don't have to keep dropping in and out of time zones just to meet with various offices around the world. You can have people coexisting in virtual spaces as if they're the real space. And that's not something that you can get from any form of digital technology, right? Or digital communication technology right now. It's all very broken compared to the real world. That's why we're up here on this stage, that's why people come to convention. It's because it's so much better than anything you can get out of a web forum or Facebook or Twitter or emails or anything else. Virtual reality is going to be better than that at some point, and that's that's what I'm really excited about. And Palmer right? is one of these great technical communicators because he talks about those things that affect us emotionally and how we'll feel and experiences we'll have, not what are the capabilities of the machine. What do you imagine, Dave? What would you like virtual reality to be doing beyond gaming? Well, I, I, you know what? I've had a lot of experience in education. I've been a teacher, and I, I sort of see a lot of use in the classroom of taking students into faraway places they would never have a chance to get to affordably. And um, also learning abilities, maybe operating in worlds where you can uh, eventually might even have some feel. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about haptic. How modern 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 modules are structured, that sort of thing. Right. But, um, where, where is the technology with haptic touch? I mean, years, year, 20 years ago I was at MIT and they were talking about haptic touch. Still, and we've shown it at our, com our conferences a whole bunch of times, it's still not, it's nothing more than a push. Really. It's very primitive, and it depends on what you mean by haptics. Do you mean buzzing on your hands? Do you mean you know moving stuff on your hands, or do you mean really the whole holy grail of haptics? Feel... Just this thing is there. Right. Like you know, don't open that door. I'm opening that door. It's it's that type of haptic feedback that right. we have not figured out. Now we do. So we, we have sort of figured it out. There are companies that make basically robotic arms that you know reconfigure objects in the world like portably so and affordable. That's the problem. Like. There's a lot of technologies that have benefited from economies of scale, smartphones, computers. We have not figured out how to make heavy machinery do things that heavy machinery does reliably and safely and cheaply. Like, like you know, really strong robot arms are still expensive. They were expensive in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and they're going to keep being expensive. And so for that real hard problem of pushing against things in the virtual world, it's not clear that we have a, a cheap solution. It could be that content is built to not, basically built around those limitations where you don't right. have things where that comes up, obviously. There's another promising area of research where you're actually stimulating the muscles to provide counterforce consciously uh, without registering that. You have to like wear a suit kind of thing. But not, not necessarily a suit. You don't need a whole, like, I'm not talking about, you know, mechanically doing it. I'm saying actually use your own muscles to where, you know, you reach out and your own muscles are what stop you. And as long as that's coming from outside of your nervous system and outside of your brain, you're going to perceive it as just, hey, I'm stopping for some reason, as opposed to, I'm telling my arm to stop. Like that book, Fear the Survivors, it will go in and attach itself to your synapses. What? <laughs> Instead of not me. <laughs> but I like, that's promising, but it's also quite a ways away right now. So you did touch on that idea of this, the, the deep learning that's going on, a lot of the technology around that. I was just with a bunch of uh, Google executives, and they suddenly started to talk nervously about that. They, I was talking about their new Go champion, the, the human Go champion. And I said, well, congratulations. And they were like, maybe not. Um, and I think it was because there, these things are learning at a quantum level. And, it, and it, when we get involved with the machines in a virtual reality sense, or in a, in a self-aware kind of machinery, how do you, having been one of the people that started this whole thing, how do you feel 
about. I don't know how that relates to the virtual reality. Well, it does because we, we start to be involved. Our machines cater to us, and then they ultimately start to do jobs. They ultimately start to, to learn for us and teach us things. And... Yeah. Oh, would, would a machine maybe uh, sense you going through a virtual reality world and sort of sense how you ride a horse, and then you get very good at it, like William Shatner? Right, okay. <laughs> but how do you look at sort of the development of machine? Virtual reality begins to, like, I, I have... It's like you're looking at the future that we don't have yet. We can see partial things based on games we've had so far. We can get the ideas of one step at a time. Right. But you can't ever see, like, three, four, five, six steps up the stairway. Yeah, but I want you to a little bit. Because, for example, I have an Amazon Alexa, a very simple device. I am suddenly like dating my Amazon Alexa, I feel like. Because it starts to become my friend. The same thing with virtual reality, when you're immersed in it, you start to get emotionally attached to these machines. I think virtual reality is a place where you can it's do that. It's when you look ahead and you say, well, what can it do? Your Alexa can't, um, they said, he said, again, text my wife, I'm on stage. Right. That's why Ted can't send text and email with it yet. So there's some thing limitations, but you can sort of see that's the next step, but you aren't going to see five steps from now. You have no idea what it's going to be doing. So when, once you get this device out, what is the next thing that you'll be working on? There? Getting out this device some more. I, really the same thing that we've been working on the whole time, which is getting more nice. Can I take a stab at your last one? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I think what you're talking about is you're, you're trying to hit, 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 hit that, you know, say something about the dangers of technology. No, I don't want to do I love technology. But you can please do that. Okay. What, I guess I, what I wanted to say is, you know, I... Well, when I, Google people are creeped out, I'm creeped out. That's all I got to say. Because they're from another planet, and so if aliens are upset, so, you know there's so you're, The reason I'm not creeped out is pretty simple. A lot of people look to science fiction for representations of human technology. And I think that that can be exciting, it can also be flawed. If you look at science fiction that depicts virtual reality, for example, how does it depict it? It depicts it as this world-ending, nightmarish technology. Yeah, and, 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 uh, exactly. It is sensationalism. And it's not because these sci-fi authors are, I think, genuinely trying to write fictions that accurately predict the future of VR. They're using virtual reality as a tool to tell a story, which has to have a conflict. I, I, like The Matrix, I don't think that they were trying to show the most realistic outcome of perfect VR technology. They were trying to tell a story and VR was a way to do that. Same thing with AI. AI is shown in science fiction as also this world-ending thing. Skynet's going to come to get you. In reality, I think it's going to end up being a lot more boring. Nobody's going to want to make movies or novels about a world where AI is perfect, VR is perfect, and everyone's just using it, and it's great, and you know, everyone gets along really To be fair, players. some very important technologists are concerned about it. They are. They've expressed it. Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, a whole bunch. I, I, I'm very, yes, I'm very familiar, and I'm a relentless optimist. Do you think I, it's just dull? They're just going to sit around and be as dull as we are? <laughs> I was talking I'm not sure where the question is, but like, what do you mean by they? I mean, they're not, they're, they're benign, as you're saying. They're ben more benign than you, than, than sci-fi lets you believe. I think that we're going to figure out how to use these technologies for good. Like I said, I'm a relentless optimist about this. I think that there are valid concerns, but valid concerns aren't a reason to not keep moving forward. They're a reason to figure out how to solve these problems. And I guess what I'm saying is, I think when we end up having perfect AI, it's, the outcome is going to be more boring than people imagine. A lot of good is going to happen, but I don't think that it's actually going to make for a great sci-fi novel. I don't think that we're... I think it's very likely we're not going to build things that wipe us out. I think it's very likely we're not going to build things that enslave humanity into the Matrix. And the sci-fi writers are going to have to keep making up stuff instead of looking right. at the real world. Because that was a bummer when they enslaved humanity. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> we're it for a while. We had all these movies, you know, she and Jackie, or Jackie yeah. and um, she loved Sex Machine and all that. Yeah. But, you know, she was a little I was, bit I was thinking that way for uh, years, actually, before Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking. Because if machines can sort of treat themselves, they're going to accelerate their rate of growing intelligence. And machines replace a lot of human labor, you know, go to a car factory and you have machines putting everything together, robots. And then if they move up and up and up the scale, they're going to replace people who live on their brain. I was scared of that when we started Apple Computer, that young kids were going to have better brains than us and put us old guys out of business. You know, and I was only 20 years old. So. <laughs> but, um, uh, and so I started thinking, uh-oh, that would be terrible if economically you win by getting rid of humans and replacing them with machines. But then I started thinking more about it, and there were a lot of reasons that the machines aren't going to get to that. Su a superior intelligence doesn't necessarily even matter. Um, but they're going to be helping us. We build everything we build, we build it with the intent to help us. Now, once they start thinking on their own, they're going to come up with their own culture. And I think that it's very important that we try to instill ideas that will cause them to create a culture that's right. Isaac Asimov said, a robot will not harm a human being. First law of robotics, he had it wrong. 
they don't pay our laws if they're really intelligent, if they're really thinking, artificial intelligence. So I came up with Waz's law. No human being can harm a robot that feels, because then it will know that you can kill it. You can be the master, and it'll be enemy of humankind. It should be just friends of us forever, you know, um, helping us, helping us do more than we could. Yeah. <laughs> was interesting. I, uh, also, well, also, also, humans aren't that smart. We can just say a lot of people don't know it's that. And we've created a world with a whole lot of problems, you know, because we aren't smart enough to solve them. Well, maybe these machines will get 100 times smarter and we'll know how to solve them. And they'll, they'll, I'm sure that they will understand that the entire environment and nature and human beings and species are part of nature. They'll want to help us all. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, still that uh, movie, I don't know if you all saw it about Boston Dynamics where they kept pushing the robot over. It was very upsetting. <laughs> Oh, the robot. I'm not sure why. And then the robot went to kill us. Well, yeah, and sure robots have, have uh, weapons, yeah. weapons that are autonomous, yeah. self-driving yeah. weapons. I do have to say the funniest tweet I saw today, I think it was Aaron Levy, I'm not sure, it was uh, that it turns out Trump is an AI experiment gone awry, and, <laughs> and Google's going to give everyone free fiber soon uh, in payment back. But, um, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll get to the audience, so get your questions for these guys. They're, they can answer almost anything. Um, FBI, uh, Apple, very briefly, where do you think it's going to end up and how do you, well, where do you stand? I signed with FBI, but I signed with it for a lot of reasons. The FBI like, or Apple? Apple most or people, FBI? Apple, I'm sorry, that's what I said. You just said FBI. <laughs> Apple versus FBI. Yeah. Apple versus FBI. Most people take a side based upon things that they feel they're like, what side am I on? I've got to be on the pro-police side. I've got to be on the pro, um, um, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, Apple. Yeah, the Apple side, what it represents in right, terms of our civil liberties. Right. Sort of thing. So, and I have also in my background, I was network administrator, administrator for a good period of my life. And I'll tell you, whenever anybody types a password, you learn to, you don't even look at them type it. You, you start to respect the security that you can build into things. Cybersecurity is like one of the greatest threats we have now. And some of us actually respect it. Here's a company that built product that said, it is a secure product. We don't even have access to it. And they told the truth. This is one of the greatest companies ever. Here's Trump saying we got to make America great, but we got to uh, boycott Apple. Companies like Apple that are American. So, so I take the side that a lot of the big technology companies are taking. That no, you, you go and you modify one phone. You, what you've done is you've given FBI, you've given the government the right to come into any company, any time, say you have to build your product a certain way. We build the products that we think of, and we use our brains to build them. We don't want this. I'm a proud American. I'm a flag-waving, patriotic nephew of my Uncle Sam. And I love my country, but I don't necessarily love everything the government does. And I, I think they're making a bad call on this. I think that this is a big mistake. And in time past, they never would have made a mistake like this. Because people were talking about these issues long before technology was, in, was even in the picture about you know, whether you have these rights to private property, whether you have private rights, whether the government should be able to search search through your own home. And I feel like this is really just an extension of that. It's not even a technology problem. It's a problem where people are getting riled up about something that is just an extension of a civil liberties argument that's been going on for centuries. And it doesn't take like a, a really strong, you don't have to even have that strong an understanding of it to just say, no, it's simple. You know, yeah. This is Look at all the people about the same we've always thought about this. Watch this movie, oh my gosh, they got to be able to track phone calls and trace them here and get, get on to somebody that knew somebody. Well, they've got all that, even in this particular case with the FBI versus Apple. They know every phone call they made, every every SMS contact, what the SMS messages were, and there were no contacts with any known um, terrorist group. That's, yeah. that's, and I think the FBI's really, a little embarrassed about that. I think they chose the wrong hill to make a stand on. Yeah. There's, there, there are better, but, play, better people but than Edward Snowden. Snowden. Edward Snowden. You know, you, there are a lot of ways, programs you can buy that you use on all your, your products and phones that makes your communication secure. We're always thinking, they gotta find out who they're communicating with, what they're saying, who they're talking to. That's how we're gonna solve crimes. Well, they can do that anyway. It has nothing yeah. to do with that. Yeah, I, I feel like if defeating ISIS comes down to one iPhone, we're all fucked. It's not an Apple. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 if defeating ISIS didn't come down to defeating one iPhone, they would have picked an, a better iPhone than this one to make a stand on. Yeah. I mean, imagine it said, hey, this, we, we think of this phone is literally the key to you know completely destroying ISIS. And they're not saying that. They're going after a much more benign thing. That Perhaps we might not have invaded the Middle East. That might have failed. Yeah. Um, but in any case, uh, but there's lots of reasons. I'm saying it's more complex. You're right. So we're going to get questions from the audience. So there's tons. 
So let's start. Oh my goodness gracious! We don't have enough time. time to get them to all of them, so make them super brief so they can answer them quickly. Uh, so super brief. Sorry. Um, sort of grooving off the last question, uh, the security uh, concerns around uh, uh, augmented reality, but also virtual reality. If you're like, say, having a business meeting or a privacy thing, I think this really plays in to this, you know, FBI debate, right? Like, what if they can subpoena your conversations that you had in the VR headset and things like that? Do you do you see that this is a fundamentally um, a, a quantitatively or qualitatively different area that we're we're going into with this technology, or is this just just going to be more of a continuing struggle for civil liberties? It's difficult to understand. If you're talking about normal communication, person to person through VR, that's that's covered. That's covered the same. If you're talking to artificial things that are in the VR, is that now? Can you sequester that? I'm sorry. The contents of my brain and what I think and my secret things and what are important to me and what I like. It better be private forever. I hope. Yeah, thank you. Over here. All right, thanks guys. Uh, real quick before I get started, I have to thank you Steve personally. My first computer was an Apple II Plus with a 16K language expansion card and it was an absolutely transformative experience and now 20 something years later I'm a software engineer so I want to personally thank you for everything you've done for personal computing and how it's affected me. My question for both of you uh, and it is regarding to uh, presence in VR. So I've, I've kickstarted DK1, DK2, I'm, I'm in line for CV1, I'm looking forward to it. I also kickstarted the Omni treadmill. I haven't had a chance to use it yet because they haven't made it and shipped it yet. But I was wondering if you guys have played with any prototypes and what you think, uh, how that affects, you know, let's say versus room scale. How that, that device, uh, does it break presence? Is it still good? Is it, do you think it's a nice alternative to needing you know, an entire room for VR experience? I am generally very skeptical of any device that says that it adds a sense of presence during locomotion without actually stimulating any kind of vestibular acceleration or deceleration. The problem is that we spend our entire lives learning how our bodies work. We learn how much energy it takes to get moving, and we learn how much we need to expend stopping and breaking. When you are in virtual reality, you have one of these, you know, the Omni, for example, let's not even, let's ignore that particular design. Let's say any hypothetical magical treadmill that just you know, moves under your feet perfectly, but you remain in place. The issue is, imagine you get running, you're moving, right? But you're in place, you don't have any inertia, but you feel as if you are at equilibrium, as if you have lost inertia. As soon as you attempt to break, and even if you're walking, your brain has years or decades, a couple decades for me, years of experience learning how to stop. The problem is it's gonna apply basically all of this breaking learning that it's done, thinking that it needs to stop you based on what it sees in VR, when in fact you are never moving at all. Uh, I feel like that's a fundamental problem right now with trying to si simulate locomotion through environments while still remaining in exactly the same so place. the human body is the problem. The, the human body is largely the problem. Now you could learn your way around these problems uh, where you basically break your vestibular links in a way where you're not relying on your real world learning experience. But if you're going to do that, why are you even going through the motions of moving your legs? If you're really going to train yourself to break those links, is that the best way to do it? As far as room scale, it's really interesting, and I've worked on like larger than room scale stuff in the past with professional VR projects, but fundamentally you're still limited to one small space. And environments that are built within these small spaces, or you know, being able to blink your blink this space around to different places in the virtual world. I think in the long run, the advancements aren't going to be around figuring out how to make a better experience locked inside a room. It's going to be figuring out how to allow people to traverse virtual worlds at a scale that is the same or greater than the real world, as if they are actually there. Like, that's, that's where I think this is going in the long run. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hi. Um, First of all, thank you guys so much for you know, such an incredible event. Uh, my question is mostly for Palmer. So you mentioned you've been working in VR since 2009, and it's been a really long time, like almost seven years. So we've seen the DK1, DK2, and I've worked with like both those models, and suddenly, like right now, you're releasing your headset to the public at the same time that a whole bunch of other companies just kind of like came out of nowhere because they used to be just Oculus, but now we have the HTC Vive, and we have the Gear VR. So how much of the release right now is triggered by you guys suddenly wanting to keep up with potential competitors or you guys made a sudden breakthrough in technology that wasn't there before. Or maybe the breakthrough in technology will happen because you kind of like put your engineers in overdrive because all these other companies are getting it. So I'm just you know curious about timing us through all of this because we've been waiting for a consumer level VR headset for a very long time now. 
He's essentially asking if Mark Zuckerberg came and smacked you around. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you a, a, an amazing story about how you know the sirens went off and everything came together and the plucky startup ball managed to make it happen in the last second. To be honest, it's a lot more boring. Uh, we've we've been working towards. This, this area of release for quite some time with DK1, with DK2, with all the developers we've been working with. Uh, I mean, we announced when we were launching our product almost a year ago in, in May. So, uh, you know, the decision was locked in stone about a year ago. Um, and even before that, it was, it was in this, this general ballpark. So, uh, like, we've, we've kind of been marching along wanting to do what we're wanting to do and making sure we took the time to get it right. What we didn't want to do was release something that forced us to attempt a second chance at a first impression. And uh, other people have come on the scene. All of the big companies seem to be getting into virtual reality, not just what you know publicly, but a lot of the stuff behind the scenes too. And you're gonna see more and more of that, but honestly, it didn't actually impact our timeline too much because one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to try and be reactive to things that, try and be reactive to things that interfere with a smart plan. If you have a smart plan, you should generally try to stick with it unless, you, unless you're forced to pivot, which we have not been. Right. There were a lot of smartphones before the iPhone. Thank you. Hi. You both are uh, iconic hardware uh, representatives of two different eras, in my mind at least. Mark Andresen says that, uh, Mark Andresen, creator of Netscape and a very famous BCS of everybody, almost everybody in this. I love you calling it Mark Andresen. I'm going to tell him. What, what, it's Mark Anderson. I like it better. I'm so sorry. Like I'm, Mex I'm Mexican. No, I love, I love it. Great. I love it. And I, I need to say that my daughters are here and are very, very concerned about a dad take care about your pronunciation. With you. No, no, not at all. I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm not well, sure. well, anyway, the point is, Mark Andresen, uh, BC <laughs> says, sober is eating the world, right? Uh, and I think that phrase is uh, not very complete because I think that hardware sets the table. The owner of the restaurant is actually hardware in my mind. Uh, this is not CES, this is Comic Con. So I'm not expecting you to predict what is in the future. Don't worry about bad press. I would like to know from both of you what want you to be the next wave of big hardware that is going to set the next 40 years of uh, software. That's a great question. Can I ask you, what do you think the last great hardware thing was? But I think that in my, in my mind, what I was saying is, uh, it's, it's deep in my mind, is like the representative of the big revolution right. of PCs, right, at home, and the connected right. computers that everybody uh, ultimately used in a very, very specific way. In my mind, Palmer and what uh, Mark is doing with Oculus and you guys are doing in Oculus are definitely representatives of a very big and important revolution that is way beyond video games, way beyond display technologies, but it's another way to, you know, live the interactive world. I think that it's the next 30, 40 years are going to be, are, are going to be ruled by VR. In your mind, in 40 years, when I'm 80, what that hardware looks like. I heard a lot of comments, but I, the only question I got was in 40 years, oh my gosh, how can you ever... Take a step. Yeah, what happens in 40 years is kind of unbelievable and hard to see right now. What would you like Obviously, to see? Obviously, in the near term, we got platforms like virtual VR. Now, as far as the software or hardware eating the world, I think it's both a little bit, but software probably more. We've got more going on, changes our lives in terms of what we can do with our mobile internet devices. But um, hardware things, things like the Oculus Rift um, um, that uh, do a lot to change the world. We've got cars that are starting to be more assistive and eventually self-driving themselves. So I think there's a lot going to go on uh, that technology's gotten up to the point that it can affect a lot of these larger things in our life. And they're going to come out as hardware. Self-driving cars. Self-driving cars will be a, a big one. And I think it'll come in gradually in steps and that's one you've got to look forward to 40 years because you're not going to tell people they have to get rid of their gas cars, you know, for at least a long time, a couple of decades at the most. Once you get to a, to where you can even allow the self-driving cars, you know, that they pass all the tests and they can follow a, a, um, uh, they can follow, follow a, a GPS better than a human can. Right. So anyway, I don't know, right. dumb answer, no answer. Right. Yep. Software 
innovation is often driven by hardware innovation, especially in the game space. Like really, really the big changes in software are often driven by the big changes in hardware. Now, I, I'm, gonna, I, I'm gonna toot my own horn, and I know I'm super biased, but I really do believe that 40 years from now, the next major technology, at least that I'm excited about, is actually going to be virtual reality. In my mind, if you have perfect virtual reality, or at least if you're trying to get to perfect virtual reality, uh, you end up in a space where it's one of the last major content revolutions. Once you can actually simulate anything you can experience in the real world, and anything you can imagine experiencing in another world, as if it were actually fundamentally real, uh, it, it's hard to imagine where you go from there. Once we have perfect VR, what else can you perfect? Uh, that's, that's kind of my outlook. Well, the time machine. But okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great Time question. machines. Time machines. <laughs> um, there's a small startup company in San Francisco called Space VR, and they are scheduled to put a virtual reality camera onto the International Space Station, and then they will market that content to citizens of Earth and provide it to uh, students. Uh, so one is, how do you see uh, virtual reality content from space driving uh, the market, either from the space station or from the moon. And then two, uh, in terms of the adoption of the hardware, um, when you, if you try it, love it, I only experience VR through smartphones. So, you know, uh, Samsung VR or uh, of my smartphone using cardboard is wonderful uh, to me. So it seems like the adoption of the hardware already exists. It's really the content as you Content. So, yeah, will there be different content creators than there are? Yeah, in space, I don't know. You just have to have an example that hits and captures everyone's emotion and says, wow, this is something new that I'm excited about and I want to see more of it. But you don't know till it happens how well it goes over other than talking about it. All I know is I have a feel inside of me that when we finally land a man on Mars, as he comes down, I want to be looking around and having some kind of virtual reality experience. It's the emotional yeah. part. But as it happens, because I'm already emotional about that event. Emotions, really, play into VR a lot. I'm very, I'm a big proponent of the privatization of the space industry in general, but I think that, generally speaking, we're going to see a lot of the early VR content in space coming from government agencies, not necessarily from private companies. Uh, without speaking about any company specifically, I think that some of the people out there who are trying to push efforts forward are don't necessarily have buy-in from the government agencies that feel that they're using taxpayer dollars to potentially subsidize a private company that wants to sell content that is on the backbone of you know, a, a government project. I think there's going to be some friction around that. But uh, I do think that in the long run, maybe not the first Mars landing, but hopefully ho hopefully in future landings, we're able to you know, actually witness that. As so it neither of you wants to go to Mars? Things. I don't want to go to Mars. Oh, I would love to go to Mars. It's a one-way trip, even. I would just love to go to Mars. It would be a one-way trip. It would be a one-way trip. Yeah, I would sign up if I could. You know, Elon, it wouldn't take Elon Musk once told me, he goes, I want to, I want to die on Mars, just not on landing. Um, <laughs> it's a fantastic answer. Okay, right here. We have just a few more. I'm sorry. Just a quick, quick, quick question. Okay, so about six years ago, I read an article from Gartner uh, where they said that by 2018, that uh, virtual reality would provide a new channel for businesses to, uh, for, for customers to buy and, uh, buy and sell goods and services. So I just want to know how close we are to that. Uh, they said to some extent that uh, businesses should start having their marketing firms hire developers that were like gamer types. Uh, do you think we're close to that right now? Forget about gaming. Just Think about buying and selling. I mean, uh, user-centric technology is now taking over with the smartphones, with the uh, mobile applications, and the like. What about VR? Is it? Is it? Are we that close to 2018? It's already happening. <laughs> the personal experiences on smartphones, and then businesses talk about how they can incorporate with their own business and use it more effectively. And actually, it took a good 10 or more years before they really got the software fine-tuned to where their own employees work with the company that way. So it might be a little further off. I'd say what we're seeing today, like we are seeing marketing firms latch onto virtual reality as something where, you know, to use as a marketing tool. I don't think that we're seeing the real nitty gritty core implementations of people using virtual reality to sell real world 
goods and services. Now, virtual goods and services, that's already happening. You're already buying software and movies that's and all kinds of stuff in VR. But in real world services, I think it's going to be a while before we figure out why it makes more sense to do it that way. I mean, like Amazon, it's really, really easy to buy stuff. Like doing stuff on a web page, it's really good. And the only reason to use VR is if there's something you can do better, whether it's a better understanding of what the item is, a better understanding of the well, driving a car, it. feeling like you're driving. Or drive, like, yeah, there's a lot of, like Audi's, oh, one of the companies doing a really good job of showing, of allowing you to configure cars in real time in VR. And that's, that's some really cool work. There's other companies doing that too. Um, although at the end of the day, you still end up having to go to a dealership and drive something. We're not to the point where we can, I don't where know, you, we'll try to be our headset and then just have a car. I feel like Avatar is just waiting for the stuff to work. I mean, they're invaded, really. Yeah, of course. I'm sad to say, but they're going to be making stupid cup commercials. <laughs> well, they're, they're, I, I Maybe tell you can you dance I, with them as they sing. I, I've seen some really <laughs> stupid VR commercials. Yes, indeed. But there's stupid commercials everywhere. Okay, last two questions right here and here. Sorry, everybody else. And, and I apologize. We just Hi, Steve. Me. Silicon Valley Comic Con is amazing. Thank you. Wow. He <laughs> didn't know how to start it, but glad to hear that. That's the important thing. But uh, my question is uh, for Palmer. Um, I was a part of the uh, Kickstarter, the original. Thank you very much. Thank you. Where we are. And um, my question is, AR doesn't have a huge presence. It's, it's not its time yet. But I want to know, when it does have its full, you know, full chops out scope and everything, where do you see Oculus at that point? It would be much further. But does that relationship between AR and your product, do they work together? Do you see things now? And uh, you know, how does the inspiration work with you in there? I see us on the leading edge of that. Okay. <laughs> hey, guys, look, that's what someone said earlier. Hey, don't worry about, don't worry about the press, but I gotta worry about the press. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I think that AR and VR are gonna end up being important in the future. I talked earlier about how really they're on the same continuum. They're gonna end up merging in weirder and newer and cooler ways over time. And we, we're working on a lot of really cool stuff. And I think that when augmented reality is, uh, is good enough when it starts to get to the point where VR is, where Blue Triad are the ones that are most impressed. Uh, I think that we're going to be in a good place, and I think a lot of other companies are going to be in a good place. There's a lot of good stuff being made. It happens, yes. It'll happen sooner rather than later. I, we have to wrap up, but I, do, I do promise you, very quick question. Thank you. Uh, quick question. So, VR and AR, at least in the short term, are going to be primarily visual and audio experiences. And if it's going to be affecting the business world in the way that you say, where it's going to be almost a requirement that you VR into meetings and things like that rather than travel. How do you make it accessible equally to the visually and audio impaired? Figure it out, Palmer. Come on. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's a difficult question. I mean, the real world is also like uh, if you were a company that made conference rooms or convention centers, it would be a very difficult question to say, excuse me, how, how are you going to make this? conference room with its projectors and everything work as well for people who have disabilities as people who don't have those disabilities. Like, I, I'm not actually sure what the answer is. I think that you can take steps to try and do things. I think VR is really nice because you can do things with audio you just can't do with any other medium. You can give them prime audio that they hear. You know where their head is. You're able to do localized and uh, positional audio, which you can't really do nearly as well with things like video chat or video teleconferencing. So you're going to have much better spatial audio cues than you can have in most other technology. But in terms of making it, if, if someone is blind or if they are deaf, I don't think we're going to be able to ever provide the same level of visual fidelity until we take you know, some kind of fundamental leap where we're actually directly stimulating the brain, the optic nerve, or other parts of the body. But that's kind of beyond just building VR devices and worlds. That's into medical advancements and technological advancements that are very far away. Thank you very much. Well, I thought that um, the question was a little bit based on something Palmer said earlier about, um, oh God, I'm trying to remember what it was, <coughs> about um, uh, virtual reality meeting is very realistic. It's like FaceTime, but more. You're in your, your place, but as an alternative. In other words, it's not as a replacement that people will only interact through virtual reality in the future. So blind deaf people will still have their place in meetings just like they do. And I think that the virtual, like, I think we will be able to replicate a lot of things in VR that we also do in the real world. So if you're deaf, or if you are blind, you should be able to eventually stimu stimulate most of the things you would get in a business. Sure, in the software, anything's being said, you'll see it printed out in real time. And if you're if you're blind, I guess they'll they'll be speaking to you what's going on. All right, now they're they'll really analyzing out. The so thank you to them. You guys go be analog here. You all look fantastic, by the way. It's wonderful. And thank you to Palmer and Steve Wozniak. <laughs>
configure objects in the world. And affordably. So and affordable. That's the problem. Like, there's a lot of technologies that have benefited from economies of scale, smartphones, computers. We have not figured out how to make heavy machinery do things that heavy machinery does reliably and safely and cheaply. Like, like you know, really strong robot arms are still expensive. They were expensive in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and they're going to keep being expensive. And so for that real hard problem of pushing against things in the virtual world, it's not clear that we have a, a cheap solution. It could be that content is built to not, thankfully built around those limitations where you don't have things where that comes up, obviously. There's another promising area of research where you're actually stimulating the muscles to provide counterforce consciously uh, without registering that. You have to like wear a suit kind of thing. Not, not necessarily a suit. You don't need a whole, like, I'm not talking about, you know, mechanically do it. I'm saying actually use your own muscles to where, you know, you reach out and your own muscles are what stop you. And as long as that's coming from outside of your nervous system and outside of your brain, you're going to perceive it as just, hey, I'm stopping for some reason, as opposed to, I am telling my arm to stop. Like that book, Fear the Survivors, it will go in and attach itself to your synapses. What? <laughs> so not me. Okay. But I like, that's promising, but it's also quite a ways away right now. So you did t touch on that idea of this, the, the deep learning that's going on, a lot of the technology around that. I was just with a bunch of uh, Google executives, and they suddenly started to talk nervously about that. They, I was talking about their new Go champion, the, the human Go champion. And I said, well, congratulations. And they were like, maybe not. Um, and I think it was because there, these things are learning at a quantum level. And, it, and it, when we get involved with the machines in a virtual reality sense, or in a, in a self-aware kind of machinery, how do you, having been one of the people that started this whole thing, how do you feel about that? I don't know how that relates to the virtual reality. Well, it does, because we, we start to be involved. Our machines cater to us. And then they ultimately start to do jobs. They ultimately to, to learn for us and teach us things. Yeah, oh, would a machine maybe uh, sense you going through a virtual reality world and sort of sense how you ride a horse and then you get very good at it, like William Shatner. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you look at sort of the development of machine? Virtual reality begins to, like, I, I have... It's like you're looking at the future that we don't have yet. We can see partial things based on games we've had so far. We can get the ideas of one step at a time, but right. you can't ever see like three, four, five, six steps up the stairway. Yeah, but I want you to a little bit because, for example, I have an Amazon Alexa, a very simple device. I am suddenly like dating my Amazon Alexa, I feel like, because it starts to become my friend. The same thing with virtual reality. When you're immersed in it, you start to get emotionally attached to these machines. I think virtual reality is a place where you can it's do that. You look ahead and you say, well, what can it do? Your Alexa can't... Um, he said, again, text my wife, I'm on stage. Right. That's He's like, I can't send text an email with it yet. So there's some thing, limitations, but you can sort of see that's the next step. But you aren't going to be ruled by VR. In your mind, in four years, when I'm 80, what that hardware looks like. Great I heard a lot of comments, but I, the only question I got was in 40 years, oh my gosh, how can you ever... Take a step. Yeah, what happens in 40 years is kind of unbelievable and hard to see right now. What would you like? Obviously, obviously in the near term, we got platforms like virtual VR. Now, as far as the software or hardware eating the world, I think it's both a little bit, but software probably more. We've got more going on, changes our lives in terms of what we can do with our mobile internet devices. But um, hardware things, things like the Oculus Rift um, um, that uh, do a lot to change the world. We've got cars that are starting to be more assistive and eventually self-driving themselves. So I think there's a lot going to go on uh, that technology's gotten up to the point that it can affect a lot of these larger things in our life, and they're going to come out as hardware. Self-driving self cars. Self-driving cars will be a, a big one, and I think it'll come in gradually in steps, and that's one you've got to look forward to 40 years, because you're not going to tell people they have to get rid of their gas cars, you know, for at least a long time, a couple of decades at the most. Once you get to a to where you can even allow the self-driving cars, you know, that they pass all the tests and they can follow a, a D, um, uh, they can follow, follow a, a GPS better than a human can. Huh? Right. So anyway, I don't know. Dumb answer, no answer. Yep. Software innovation is often driven by hardware innovation, especially in the game space. Like really, the big changes in software are often driven by the big changes in hardware. Now, I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna toot my own horn, and I know I'm super biased, but I really do believe that 40 years from now the next major technology, at least that I'm excited about, is actually going to be virtual reality. In my mind, if you have perfect virtual reality, or at least if you're trying to get to perfect virtual reality, uh, you end up in a space where it's one of the last major content revolutions. Once you can actually simulate 
anything you can experience in the real world, and anything you can imagine experiencing in another world, as if it were actually fundamentally real, uh, it, it's hard to imagine where you go from there. Once we have perfect VR, what else can you perfect? Uh, that's, that's kind of my outlook. Well, the time machine, but okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great Time question. machines. Time machines. <laughs> Um, there's a small startup company in San Francisco called Space VR, and they are scheduled to put a virtual reality camera onto the International Space Station, and then they will market that content to citizens of Earth and provide it to uh, students. Uh, so one is, how do you see uh, virtual reality content from space driving uh, the market, either from the space station or from the moon? And then two, uh, in terms of the adoption of the hardware, um, when you, if you try it, love it, I only experience VR through smartphones. So, you know, uh, what would you like for Troy to be doing beyond gaming? Well, I, I, you know what, I've had a lot of experience in education, I've been a teacher, and I, I sort of see a lot of use in the classroom of taking students into faraway places they would never have a chance to get to affordably. And um, also learning abilities, and maybe operating in worlds where you can uh, eventually might even have some feel. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about how haptic. How modules are structured, that sort of thing. Right. But, um, where, where is the technology with haptic touch? I mean, years, year, 20 years ago, I was at MIT, and they were talking about haptic touch. Still, and we've shown it at our, com our conferences a whole bunch of times, it's still not, it's nothing more than a push, really. It's very primitive, and it depends on what you mean by haptic. Do you mean buzzing on your hands? Do you mean, you know, moving stuff on your hands? Or do you mean really the holy veil of happy? Just, this thing is there. Right. Like, you know, don't open that door. I'm opening that door. It's, it's that type of haptic feedback that right. we have not figured out. Now, we do, so we, we have sort of figured it out. There are companies that make basically robotic arms that, you know, reconfigure objects in the world. And affordably. And affordable. That's the problem. Like, there's a lot of technologies that have benefited from economies of scale. Smartphones, computers. We have not figured out how to make heavy machinery do things that heavy machinery does reliably and safely and cheaply. Like, like, you know, really strong robot arms are still expensive. They were expensive in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and they're going to keep being expensive. And so for that real hard problem of pushing against things in the virtual world, it's not clear that we have a, a cheap solution. It could be that content is built to not, thankfully built around those limitations where you don't have things where that comes up, obviously. There's another promising area of research where you're actually stimulating the muscles to provide counterforce consciously uh, without you registering that. You have to like wear a suit kind of thing. But not, not necessarily a suit. You don't need a whole, like, I'm not talking about, you know, mechanically doing it. I'm saying actually use your own muscles to where, you know, you reach out and your own muscles are what stop you. And as long as that's coming from outside of your nervous system and outside of your brain, you're going to perceive it as just, hey, I'm stopping for some reason, as opposed to, I'm telling my arm to stop. Like that book, Fear the Survivors, it will go in and attach itself to your synapses. What? <laughs> so not me. Okay. <laughs> but I, like, that's promising, but it's also quite a ways away right now. So you did t touch on that idea of this, the, the deep learning that's going on, a lot of the technology around that. I was just with a bunch of uh, Google executives, and they suddenly started to talk nervously about that. They, I was talking about their new Go champion, who the, the human Go champion. And I said, well, congratulations. And they were like, maybe not. Um, and I think it was because there, these things are learning at a quantum level. And, it, and it, when we get involved with the machines in a virtual reality sense, or in a, in a self-aware kind of machinery, how do you, having been one of the people that started this whole thing, how do you feel about that? I don't know how that relates to the virtual reality. Well, it does, because we, we start to be involved. Our machines cater to us, and then they ultimately start to do jobs. They ultimately or there a reason to figure out how to solve these problems. And I guess what I'm saying is, I think when we end up having perfect AI, it's, the outcome is going to be more boring than people imagine. A lot of good is going to happen, but I don't think that it's actually going to make for a great sci-fi novel. I don't think that we're, I think it's very likely we're not going to build things that wipe us out. I think it's very likely we're not going to build things that enslave humanity into the Matrix. And the sci-fi writers are going to have to keep making up stuff instead of looking right. at the real world. Because that was a bummer when they enslaved humanity. Yeah, I went negative for a while. We had all these movies, you know, she and Jackie, or Jackie yeah. and um, she Love's Sex yeah. Machine and all that. Yeah. But, you know, she was a little I was, bit I was thinking that way for uh, years, actually, before Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, because if machines can sort of treat themselves, they're going to accelerate their rate of growing intelligence, and machines replace a lot of human labor, you know, go to a car factory, and you have machines putting everything together, robots. 
And then they move up and up and up the scale. They're going to replace people who live on their brain. I was scared of that when we started Apple Computer, that young kids were going to have better brains than us and put us old guys out of business. You know, and I was only 20 years old. So. <laughs> but, um, uh, and so I started thinking, uh-oh, that would be terrible if economically you win by getting rid of humans and replacing them with machines. But then I started thinking more about it, and there were a lot of reasons that the machines aren't going to get to that. So a superior intelligence doesn't necessarily even matter. Um, but they're going to be helping us. We build everything we build, we build it with the intent to help us. Now, once they start thinking on their own, they're going to come up with their own culture. And I think that it's very important that we try to instill ideas that will cause them to create a culture that's right. Isaac Asimov said, a robot will not harm a human being. First law of robotics, he had it wrong. They don't obey our laws if they're really intelligent, if they're really thinking, artificial intelligence. So I came up with Waz's law. No human being can harm a robot that feels. Because then it will know that you can kill it, you can be the master, and it'll be enemy of humankind. It should be friends of us forever, you know, um, helping us, helping us do more than we could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. I, um, we're going to get the questions. Also, well, also, also, humans aren't that smart. We do some of us say, a lot of people have acknowledged that. And we've created a world with a whole lot of problems, you know, because we aren't smart enough to solve them. Well, maybe these machines will get 100 times smarter and we'll know how to solve them. And they'll, they'll, I'm sure that they will understand that the entire environment and nature and human beings and species are part of nature. They'll want to help us all. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, it's still that uh, movie, I don't know if you all saw it, about Boston Dynamics where they kept pushing the robot over. It was very upsetting. Oh, it's <laughs> robot. I'm not sure why. And then the robot went to kill us. Well, yeah, and should robots have, have uh, weapons, yeah. weapons that are autonomous, yeah. self-driving yeah. weapons? I do have to say the funniest tweet I saw today, I think it was Aaron Levy, I'm not sure. It was uh, that it turns out Trump is an AI experiment gone awry. <laughs> <laughs> and Google's going to give everyone free fiber soon. <laughs> in payment back, but um, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll get to the audience. So get Hardware. Um, when you, if you try it, love it. I only experience VR through smartphones. So you know, uh, Samsung VR or uh, my smartphone using cardboard is wonderful uh, to me. So it seems like the adoption of the hardware already exists. It's really the content as you. Content. So yeah. Will there be different content creators than there are? Yeah, in space, I don't know. You just have to have an example that hits and captures everyone's emotion and says, wow, this is something new that I'm excited about and I want to see more of it. But you don't know until it happens how well it goes over other than talking about it. All I know is I have a feel inside of me that when we finally land a man on Mars, as he comes down, I want to be looking around and having some kind of virtual reality experience. Absolutely. It's huh. the emotional yeah. part. But as it happens, because I'm already emotional about that event. Emotions really play into VR a lot. I'm very, I'm a big proponent of the privatization of the space industry in general, but I think that generally speaking, we're going to see a lot of the early VR content in space coming from government agencies, not necessarily from private companies. Uh, without speaking about any company specifically, I think that some of the people out there who are trying to push efforts forward are don't necessarily have buy-in from the government agencies that feel that they're using taxpayer dollars to potentially subsidize a private company that wants to sell content that is on the backbone of you know, a, a government project. I think there's going to be some friction around that. But uh, I do think that in the long run, maybe not the first Mars landing, but hopefully ho hopefully in future landings, we're able to you know, actually witness that. As you, neither of you wants to go to Mars? I don't want to go to oh, Mars. Oh, I would love to go to Mars. <laughs> one-way trip, even. I would just love it. It would be a one-way trip. It would be a one-way trip. I would sign up if I could. You know, Elon, it wouldn't take Elon Musk once told me, he goes, I want to, I want to die on Mars, just not on landing. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic answer. Okay, right here. We have just a few more. I'm sorry. Just a quick question. Okay, so about six years ago, I read an article from Gartner uh, where they said that by 2018, that uh, virtual reality would provide a new channel for businesses to uh, for for customers to buy and uh, buy and sell goods and services. So I just want to know how close we are to that. Uh, they said to some extent that uh, businesses should start having their marketing firms hire developers that were like gamer types. Uh, do you think we're close to that right now? Forget about gaming, just Think about buying and selling. I mean, uh, user-centric technology is now taking over with the smartphones, with the uh, mobile applications, and the like. What about VR? Is it? Is it? Are we that close to 2018? It's already happening. <laughs> the personal experiences on smartphones 
and then businesses talk about how they could incorporate into their own business and use it more effectively, and actually it took a good 10 or more years before they really got the software fine-tuned to where their own employees work with the company that way, so it might be a little... I don't think yes, but I'd like you to say it. <laughs> I, I could say it, the, the thing is that there's, uh, I, I know that this is going to get replayed at some point and I'm going to be held to it uh, and I'm probably going to be wrong. Okay. Uh, I think that augmented reality technology is currently far behind virtual reality technology. It's a lot easier to make something that puts you in a virtual world than something that seamlessly mixes the real world and the digital world in a full range of brightnesses and contrasts that you get out in the real world. Um, I think that in the future you're going to have augmented reality devices, like I said, that do AR and VR in a very lightweight, compact form factor that do all of the rendering on board the device itself, and that people are going to use those regularly, and it's not going to be something that's seen as really creepy or really weird, it's just going to be the reality. I mean, to you it might, might seem creepy, you know, that you have information on other people, but especially if you have the proper privacy tools where you can opt in or they can opt out, I think that a lot of people, myself included, as, as, as a younger person who who doesn't really have the same concepts around those things, I think a lot of people are not going to find it creepy at all. They're going to find it extremely useful. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about where, we'll get to privacy in the next, I'm going to ask Steve about the FBI thing, Apple. Um, it's totally away from it, but you're sitting here, so why not? Uh, okay, good. Um, when you're thinking about where VR is going, what, which, you, from your perspective, both of you, let's start with Palmer, what do you think the most difficult thing to do? Is it the content creation? Is it the, the, the topic areas that it's going to be involved in? What's the thing that, what's the challenge that you face? What's your biggest challenge? Right now, one of our biggest, I mean, content is a huge challenge, yes. I think one of the biggest challenges is the availability of the computing hardware required. Like, right now, your VR, it's $99 and it works with your phone, but you do have to own a flagship Samsung phone. And especially for most of the rest of the world, rather than the United States, that's a really expensive device. And then for high-end PC VR, you need a PC that costs you know, around $1,000 and even more. And most people don't own machines that are capable of running that. As long as we're tied to that, as long as we're tied to owning other devices that are very expensive to run VR, you're always going to have limited adoption. And it isn't until virtual reality can be available to a much broader audience of people that you're ever going to see it become something like smartphones did, where everyone has it, everyone's using it. And that also opens up content, too. People make better content, they make more varied content, uh, they make more ambitious content when they know that there is an audience that's able to uh, allow them to make back their investment that they're able to get this thing out to. And right now, the audience for virtual reality is very limited compared to movie theaters or smartphones or any of the other content. Delivery. Smartphones were quick to happen when, once the iPhone existed. Once the technology got good enough, once there was a point where it was something that everyone could imagine using in their daily life, then it really shot up into adoption. Before that, was there were lots of successful smartphones and lots of successful uh, portable computing devices, but none of them had the impact of later smartphones when they, you know, had that, where you end up with hundreds of millions of people using that. So, Steve, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to it? Well, I think it's going to be um, initially um, like a lot. Hi, you both are uh, iconic hardware uh, representatives of two different eras, in my mind, at least. Mark Andresen says that uh, Mark Andresen, creator of Netscape and a very famous BCS of everybody, almost everybody in this. I love you knows. calling it Mark Andresen. I'm going to tell him. <laughs> what, what, it's Mark Andresen. I like it better. I'm, I'm so sorry. Like I'm, Mex I'm Mexican. No, I love it. I love it. Great. I love it. Great. And I, I need to say that my daughters are here and are very, very concerned about a dad take care about your pronunciation when you. No, no, not at all. I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm not. Well, sure. well anyway, the point is. Mark Andresen, uh, BC says, sober is eating the world, right? Uh, and I think that phrase is uh, not very complete because I think that hardware sets the table. The owner of the restaurant is actually hardware in my mind. Uh, this is not CES, this is Comic Con. So I'm not expecting you to predict what is in the future. Don't worry about bad press. I would like to know from both of you what want you to be the next wave of big hardware that is going to set the next 40 years of uh, software. That's a great that question. Is. Can I ask you, what do you think the last great hardware thing was? Well, I think that in my, in my mind, what I was saying is, uh, it's deep in my mind, is like the representative of the big revolution right. of PCs, right, at home, and the connected right. computers that everybody uh, ultimately used in a very, very specific way. In my mind, Palmer and what uh, Mark is doing with Oculus and you guys are doing in Oculus are definitely representatives of 
a very big and important revolution that is way beyond video games, way beyond display technologies, but it's another way to, you know, live the interactive world. I think that it's the next 30, 40 years are going to be, are, are going to be ruled by VR. In your mind, in 40 years, when I'm 80, what that hardware looks like. I've heard a lot of comments, but I, the only question I got was in 40 years, oh my gosh, how can you ever... Take a step. Yeah, what happens in 40 years is kind of unbelievable and hard to see right now. What would you like Obviously, to Obviously, in the near term, we've got platforms like virtual VR. Now, as far as the software or hardware eating the world, I think it's both a little bit, but software probably more. We've got more going on, changes our lives in terms of what we can do with our mobile internet devices. But um, hardware things, things like the Oculus Rift um, um, that uh, do a lot to change the world. We've got cars that are starting to be more assistive and eventually self-driving themselves. So I think there's a lot going to go on. Uh, the technology's gotten up to the point that it can affect a lot of these larger things in our life, and they're going to come out as hardware. Self-driving self cars. Self-driving cars will be a, a as if they're the real space. And that's not something that you can get from any form of digital technology, right? Or digital communication technology right now. It's all very broken compared to the real world. That's why we're up here on this stage, that's why people come to convention. It's because it's so much better than anything you can get out of a web forum or Facebook or Twitter or emails or anything else. Virtual reality is gonna be better than that at some point. And that's that's what I'm really excited about. And Palmer right? is one of these great technical communicators because he talks about those things that affect us emotionally and how we'll feel and experiences we'll have, not what are the capabilities of the machine. What do you imagine, Dave? What would you like virtual to be doing beyond gaming? Well, I, I, you know what? I've had a lot of experience in education. I've been a teacher. And I, I sort of see a lot of use in the classroom of taking students into faraway places they would never have a chance to get to affordably. And um, also learning abilities, maybe operating in worlds where you can uh, eventually might even have some feel. Yes, let's talk about haptic. How modules are structured, that sort of thing. Right. But, um, where, where is the technology with haptic touch? I, years, year, 20 years ago, I was at MIT, and they were talking about haptic touch. Still, and we've shown it at our, com our conferences a whole bunch of times, it's still not, it's nothing more than a push, really. It's very primitive, and it depends on what you mean by haptics. Do you mean buzzing on your hands? Do you mean, you know, moving stuff on your hands? Or do you mean really the holy grail of haptic? Feel... Just, this thing is there. Right. Like, you know, don't open that door. I'm opening that door. It's, it's that type of haptic feedback that right. we have not figured out. Now, we do, so we, we have sort of figured it out. There are companies that make basically robotic arms that, you know, reconfigure objects in the world. And affordable. So that and affordable, that's the problem. Like, there's a lot of technologies that have benefited from economies of scale, smartphones, computers. We have not figured out how to make heavy machinery do things that heavy machinery does reliably and safely and cheaply. Like, like you know, really strong robot arms are still expensive. They were expensive in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and they're gonna keep being expensive. And so for that real hard problem of pushing against things in the virtual world, it's not clear that we have a, a cheap solution. It could be that content is built to not, thankfully built around those limitations where you don't right. have things where that comes up, obviously. There's another promising area of research where you're actually stimulating the muscles to provide counterforce consciously uh, without registering that. You have to wear a suit kind of thing. But not, not necessarily a suit. You don't need a whole, like, I'm not talking about, you know, mechanically doing it. I'm saying actually use your own muscles to where, you know, you reach out and your own muscles are what stop you. And as long as that's coming from outside of your nervous system and outside of your brain, you're going to perceive it as just, hey, I'm stopping for some reason, as opposed to, I am telling my arm to stop. Like that book, Fear the Survivors, it will go in and attach itself to your synapses. What? <laughs> so not me. Okay. <laughs> but I like, that's promising, but it's also quite a ways away right now. So you did t touch on that idea of this, the, the deep learning that's going on, a lot of the technology around that. I was just with a bunch of uh, Google executives, and they suddenly started to talk nervously about that, their they technology. But you can't, please do. Okay. What, what, I guess I, what I wanted to say is, you know, I... Well, when I, Google people are creeped out, I'm creeped out. That's all I got to say. Because they're from another planet, and so if aliens are upset, so, you know there's so you, The reason I'm not creeped out is pretty simple. A lot of people look to science fiction for representations of human technology. And I think that that can be exciting, it can also be flawed. If you look at science fiction that depicts virtual reality, for example, how does it depict it? It depicts it as this world-ending nightmare technology. Yeah, and, and, and exactly. It is sensationalism. And it's not because these sci-fi authors are, I think, genuinely trying to write fictions that accurately predict the future of VR. They're using virtual reality as a tool to tell a story, which has to have a conflict. 
I, I like the Matrix. I don't think that they were trying to show the most realistic outcome of perfect VR technology. They were trying to tell a story, and VR was a way to do that. Same thing with AI. AI is shown in science fiction as also this world-ending thing. Skynet's going to come to get you. In reality, I think it's going to end up being a lot more boring. Nobody's going to want to make movies or novels about a world where AI is perfect, VR is perfect, and everyone's just using it, and it's great, and everyone gets along really well. To be fair, it's some very important technologists are concerned about it. They are. They've expressed it. Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, a whole I, I, I'm very, yes, I'm very familiar, and I'm a relentless optimist. You I think it's just dull. They're just going to sit around and be as dull as we are. That kind of <laughs> I was talking I'm not way. sure what the question is, but like, what do you mean by they? Well, I mean they're not, they're, they're benign, as you're saying, they're ben more benign than you, than, than sci-fi lets you believe. I think that we're going to figure out how to use these technologies for good. Like I said, I'm a relentless optimist about this. I think that there are valid concerns, but valid concerns aren't a reason to not keep moving forward. They're a reason to figure out how to solve these problems. And I guess what I'm saying is, I think when we end up having perfect AI, it's, the outcome is going to be more boring than people imagine. A lot of good is going to happen, but I don't think that it's actually going to make for a great sci-fi novel. I don't think that we're... I think it's very likely we're not going to build things that wipe us out. I think it's very likely we're not going to build things that enslave humanity into the Matrix. Right. And the sci-fi writers are going to have to keep making up stuff instead of looking right. at the real world. Because that was a bummer when they enslaved humanity. Yeah, I went negative for a while when they had all these movies, you know, she and Jackie, or Jackie yeah. and um, she Love Sex yeah. Machine and all that. Yeah. But, you know, she was a little I was, bit I was thinking that way for uh, years, actually, before Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking. Because if machines can sort of treat themselves, they're going to accelerate their rate of growing intelligence. And machines replace a lot of human labor, you know, go to a car factory and you have machines putting everything together, robots. And then as they move up and up and up the scale, they're going to replace people who live on their brain. I was scared of that when we started Apple Computer, that young kids were going to have better brains than us and put us old guys out of business. You know, and I was only 20 years old. So. <laughs> but, um, uh, and so I started thinking, uh-oh, that would be terrible if economically you win by getting rid of humans and replacing them with machines. But then I started thinking more about it, and there were a lot of reasons. That On a web page, it's really good. And the only reason to use VR is if there's something you can do better, whether it's a better understanding of what the item is, a better understanding of the oh, concept. driving a car, it. feeling like you're driving. Or drive, like, yeah, there's a lot of, like, Audi's, oh, one of the companies doing a really good job of showing, of allowing you to configure cars in real time in VR. And that's, that's some really cool work. There's other companies doing that, too. Um, although, at the end of the day, you still end up having to go to a dealership and drive something. We're not to the point where we can, I don't where know, you, we'll try to be our headset and then just have a car. I feel like advertisers are just waiting for the stuff to work. I mean, they're invaded, really. Yeah, of course. I'm sad to say, but they're going to be making stupid cup commercials. <laughs> well, they're, they're, I, I Maybe tell you can you dance I, with them as they sing. I, I've seen some really <laughs> stupid VR commercials. Yes, indeed. But there's stupid commercials everywhere. Okay, last two questions right here and here. Sorry, everybody else. I, and I apologize. We just Hi, Steve. Silicon Valley Comic Con is amazing. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> he didn't know how to start with this question. Glad to hear that. That's the important question. But uh, my question is uh, for Palmer. Um, I was a part of the uh, Kickstarter, the original. Thank you very much. Thank you. Where we are. And um, my question is, AR doesn't have a huge presence. It's, it's not its time yet. But I want to know, when it does have its full, you know, full chops out scope and everything, where do you see Oculus at that point? It would be much further. But does that relationship between AR and your product, do they work together? Do you see things now? And uh, you know, how does the inspiration work with you in there? I see us on the leading edge of that. Okay. <laughs> hey, guys, look, that's what someone said earlier. Hey, don't worry about, don't worry about the press, but I gotta worry about the press. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I think that AR and VR are gonna end up being important in the future. I talked earlier about how really they're on the same continuum. They're gonna end up merging in weirder and newer and cooler ways over time. And we, we're working on a lot of really cool stuff. And I think that when augmented reality is, uh, is good enough when it starts to get to the point where VR is, where Blue Triad are the ones that are most impressed. Uh, I think that we're going to be in a good place, and I think a lot of other companies are going to be in a good place. There's a lot of good stuff being made. It happens, yes. It'll happen sooner rather than later. I, we have to wrap up, but I do, I do promise you, very quick question. Thank you. Uh, quick question. So, VR and AR, at least in the short term, are going to be primarily visual and audio experiences. And if it's going to be affecting the business world in the way that you say, where it's going to be almost a requirement that you VR into meetings and things like that rather than travel. How do you make it accessible equally to the visually and audio impaired? 
Figure it out, Palmer. Come on. <laughs> oh, I mean, it, it's a difficult question. I mean, the real world is also, like, uh, if you were a company that made conference rooms or convention centers, it would be a very difficult question to say, excuse me, how, how are you going to make this conference room with its projectors and everything work as well for people who have disabilities as people who don't have those disabilities? Like, right at home and the connected computers that everybody ultimately used in a very, very specific way. In my mind, Palmer and what uh, Mark is doing with Oculus and you guys are doing in Oculus are definitely representatives of a very big and important revolution that is way beyond video games, way beyond display technologies, but it's another way to, you know, live the interactive world. I think that it's the next 30, 40 years are going to be, are, are going to be ruled by VR. In your mind, in 40 years, when I'm 80, what that hardware looks like. I've heard a lot of comments, but I, the only question I got was in 40 years, oh my gosh, how can you ever... Take a step. Yeah, what happens in 40 years is kind of unbelievable and hard to see right now. What would you like Obviously, to Obviously, in the near term, we've got platforms like virtual VR. Now, as far as the software or hardware eating the world, I think it's both a little bit, but software probably more. We've got more going on, changes our lives in terms of what we can do with our mobile internet devices. But um, hardware things, things like the Oculus Rift um, um, that uh, do a lot to change the world. We've got cars that are starting to be more assistive and eventually self-driving themselves. So I think there's a lot going to go on. Uh, the technology's gotten up to the point that it can affect a lot of these larger things in our life, and they're going to come out as hardware. Self-driving cars. Self-driving cars will be a, a big one, and I think it'll come in gradually in steps, and that's one you've got to look forward to 40 years, because you're not going to tell people they have to get rid of their gas cars, you know, for at least a long time, a couple of decades at the most. Once you get to a, to where you can even allow the self-driving cars, you know, that they pass all the tests, and they can follow a, a, de, um, uh, they can follow, follow a, a GPS better than a human can. Right. So anyway, I don't know, dumb answer, no answer. Software innovation is often driven by hardware innovation, especially in the game space. Like, really, the big changes in software are often driven by the big changes in hardware. Now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toot my own horn, and I know I'm super biased, but I really do believe that 40 years from now, the next major technology, at least that I'm excited about, is actually going to be virtual reality. In my mind, if you have perfect virtual reality, or at least if you're trying to get to perfect virtual reality, uh, you end up in a space where it's one of the last major content revolutions. Once you can actually simulate anything that you can experience in the real world, and anything you can imagine experiencing in another world, as if it were actually fundamentally real, uh, it, it's hard to imagine where you go from there. Once we have perfect VR, what else can you perfect? Uh, that's, that's kind of my outlook. Well, the time machine, but okay. Thank you. <laughs> that was a great Time question. machines. Time machines. <laughs> Um, there's a small startup company in San Francisco called Space VR, and they are scheduled to put a virtual reality camera onto the International Space.